Hey there, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome. Welcome to the program. Coming to you from my healing room here on St. Croix. Welcome to the weekend. Um, let's do, let me put up something. Yeah, um, how you doing? Welcome to the weekend. It is, in fact, Friday, March, April 5th, Friday, April 5th, 2024, listening to the Children of the Sun broadcast on WSDX AM 970. A show dedicated to positive energy from a fifth dimensional metaphysical point of view. So, I want to give a big shout out and welcome to Christian Stead, Frederick Stead, King Hill, why not? Book Island, St. Thomas, St. John. BVI, Antigua, Aruba, St. Kitts, Nevis, Up Island, Down Island, and really all around the world, because we are broadcasting live over the internet. You can get us on uh, WSTX's Facebook page, my Facebook page, Sacred Breath Podcast, anytime, anywhere, anywhere. Mm -hmm. Take off the... Um, I don't know. The, the Facebook's been kind of glitchy lately. I'm thinking that without a video, they might do better. Ah, but I also want to talk about authenticity. Yeah, let's just keep this a regular radio program. Listen live on the WSTX um, internet page. You get really great audio there.
Well, you know, like um, as uh, many of you know, I do I do rebirthing breath work, and the thing about that work is that it puts you in touch with the deepest core of your essential self, which means you you can't skate on the surface of life anymore. You can't be shallow and superficial. And there's a lot of pressure, especially here, to stick to the shallow and superficial because, you know, in other words, not to be authentic. Um, if we get into criticizing U.S. foreign policy, we, the President of the United States is one of our regular visitors at the House here. So that's uncomfortable. Most, this is a touristy island. People come here to drink and get sunburned, right? The biggest problem they want to have while they're here is um, getting the sand out of their bathing suit. But just because we are a touristy kind of island and we have important people who live here and we get visitors who just want to relax that doesn't mean we have to be shallow superficial people of course others would say we've got our own local problems which are enough for a full plate And in the show before me, they really do a good job of getting into those local problems. I think we can get some instruction, though, from um, some other things going on in the world. I mean, one of the biggest things for me if you look at what, what is one of the um, greatest benefits of what has been going on in Israel and the Gaza Strip over the last six, seven months is the, di the, the dichotomy between what we're being told is happening versus what we can see with our own eyes is happening. You know, this is a relatively new thing. Even though the internet's been around for a while, um, probably it's only been the last five years or so where you could see with your own eyes what was really going on versus what the government spokespeople and the corporate news media anchors were telling you was going on. So... And uh, and even before, like with police brutality issues in the states, those were short video. You know, it was just a, a, a one incident, so then maybe one or two people around. It wasn't something going on month after month after month with hundreds of people uploading videos. So you, you, you turn on your cell phone and you see with your own eyes what's actually happening. And then you turn on the news media and hear the government spokesperson or the corporate news media spokesperson telling you what's happening. And you can see they're completely different. And people, you know, at this point, pretty much everyone is saying to themselves, they're looking at me straight in my eye and they're just lying. They're just straight up lying to me. Anybody that hasn't figured that out by now doesn't want to know and will never. Know. And then, you know, some people are so hopelessly inured in the system that they will never be capable of seeing other than what the spokespeople want them to see, and they will always believe whatever they're told to believe. But most people, vast majority of people, are now able to see for themselves that the stories they're told are just that stories and they don't really match reality. 
in this instant. But that's the thing. It's only a matter of time before people begin to ask themselves the next inevitable question. Well, if they're lying to me straight up to my face right now, where we have this easy access of everybody in the Gaza Strip got a cell phone that can film a video and send it around the world. What about before we had that? What about five years ago, 10 years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago? Were they lying to us then? Spoiler alert. Yes, sweetheart, they were lying to you then. They have always been lying to you. Spoiler alert number two. Anytime you hear a government spokesperson or a corporate news media spokesperson talking about the importance of protecting the Internet or keeping the Internet safe, what they mean is the importance of them getting back control over the Internet, getting back control over the information that you are allowed to see. Because letting you have unfettered access to the truth and to see with your own eyes what's actually going on is not helpful to the propaganda interest of the empire. So that's a cat out of the bag and toothpaste out of the toothpaste tube. They want to get back in as soon as they can. So in order to really understand what's really going on, it, it, it needs from us a deeper authenticity. We cannot be shallow, superficial consumers of news product anymore. We cannot be shallow, superficial consumers of any product skating on the surface of life anymore. People living in isolation whose soul function is to purchase product. McDonald's hamburgers, flat screen TVs are the latest CNN broadcast. It's all the same thing. It keeps you at the surface of life instead of going down deep into it. It makes you inauthentic. It makes you not a real person, a plastic person. Plastic people are fine with genocide. Genocide doesn't bother plastic people. And, but I'm arguing for an even, you know, it's deeper than just picking a side. Oh, Israel's committing genocide in Gaza, so now I hate Israel. That's not it. Or you hate Benjamin Netanyahu, you blame him for everything. That's not it. Or see, political philosophy is Zionism. You, you hate that. That's not it. Hatred is never it. That's the same insanity that got us here in the first place. Or you hate Hamas for October 7th. That's not it. Or you blame all the Palestinians for October 7th and you hate all Palestinians. That's not it. Or you blame the 75 years of occupation prior to October 7th where the Palestinians were brutally oppressed for 75 years and you hate the government of Israel, the state, that's not it. Hatred is never it. We have two traumatized people who are triggering each other and then re-triggering each other and then re-re-triggering each other in a downward spiral into insanity that has a very real risk of running 
dragging the entire world into a world Armageddon. And don't think that, you know, you can just blame it on Middle East Bible crazies. You know, the, the Semitic religions, Judeo-Christian, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, lots of scientific secularists in Europe responsible for global warming, birds dropping out of the sky dead from the heat. I mean, I want to get in the catalog of all the bad effects coming from, from climate change. But that has really nothing to do with the religions of the Middle East. So you're not off the hook if you don't share any particular sympathies with those religions. And again, you know, <clears throat> Picking a side, watching Fox News and deciding global warming is a hoax, and you hate the liberals for trying to use it to control everybody, or watching MSNBC and deciding global warming is the existential problem of our time, and you, you hate the ExxonMobil corporate execs for lying to us all these years. Hatred is never the answer. All of these people are behaving as, as they, in the only way they possibly can because they suffer from the same insanity that the rest of us suffer from. The, the, the egoic consciousness of mankind, which did, which for the last 10,000 years or so has been the way that we have been interacting with each other and with our environment. And it did a very good job, but we've gotten to the point now where it is going to get us all killed. So we need a shift in consciousness. And that shift in consciousness begins by transcending us versus them mentality. Right versus wrong, blaming and judging. I've always liked the way that Eckhart Tolle puts it. If you took the entire history of the human race and pretended like it was the psychological file of a single patient, looking at the history of the human race as if this was one person doing all these things, some good, some bad, Genocides in Gaza, yeah, but, you know, cathedrals and Sistine Chapel. Great works of art, great political experiments, great acts of monstrous inhuman barbarity. If you pretended like the entire human race was one person and gave that the history of the human race to a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist as a file to diagnose, the diagnosis would be Acute paranoid schizophrenia subject to extreme bouts of violence with occasional glimpses of sanity. So that requires healing, not fighting against, not making wrong, not judging, not blaming. It requires healing. It requires healing. We need to heal the traumatized people on this planet. 
traumatized people in our community, traumatized people in the Middle East. Heal them through unconditional love, which requires going deep down into your core authenticity. It requires community. No one is on by themselves, alone by themselves, without relate relationship with others is what brings out the authenticity in us. Community isn't possible. Real community is not is not possible unless people are being real, being authentic. Pretend plastic people don't have community. They have acquaintances. There's no relational bonding between pretend plastic people. They're just using one another. Community is not about using one another. It is about being there for each other. And I really think that the shift in consciousness that breathwork helps to bring about opens up that possibility of a deeper community, of a deeper authenticity. But I mean real breathwork, not shallow breathwork, because there's a lot of that these days. It is not in the interest of this this egoic mind, which is basically insane and is on the verge of killing us all, either with a world war in the Middle East or global warming, climate change. Giving us a, a choice in November, well, You know, the insane negative ego might give us a fascist in November as president if he doesn't kill us first. And that ego does not want you to be authentic. It does not, it wants you shallow and superficial, staying on the surface, being a consumer. Loving your country only in so far as it makes it easy for you to buy things. This deep connectedness, this deep connectedness that I'm talking about is the biggest threat to this insane ego. or authenticity to rob it of its value by commercializing it, making it shallow, making it superficial, keeping it non-threatening, unchallenging to the dominant narrative of you could say again, the empire, but the empire is really just a subset of the global egoic way of looking at the world. In which you see yourself 
as a separate entity and therefore constantly under threat. And therefore you have to constantly protect yourself. The human condition is a traumatized condition. Acute paranoid schizophrenia. Everyone is a potential enemy. And you have to be careful to keep yourself safe. But there's another way of looking at the world. Where you see all of us as one. And yourself as part of the tapestry of life. Totally safe because Life cannot be extinguished. Life will always go on. And everyone who appears to threaten you is really only asking you to teach them love the only way they know how. And if you respond with love, that will bring out of them their loving response and you heal one another. If you respond with hatred and anger, they will respond likewise and you make each other sick. So this Collective insanity has a desire, a tendency to protect itself. And so it likes to keep things superficial. Um, you know, yoga, yoga began, Patanjali, the founding father of yoga, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. I have three copies of that book. One is just a straight up translation. One is an esoteric interpretation done by Alice Bailey, a theosophical offshoot, channeling Draw Cole, an ascended master. And one is a, it's an interpretation by a longtime female Hindu, Western Hindu convert but good Western because um, I don't speak Sanskrit. Um, pr a practitioner for decades. And so it's, it's, it begins as very deep psychological interpretation of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, but it then it gets into very profound spiritual esoteric understanding as well. And the thing about the yoga sutras of Patanjali is there's no Hatha yoga in it. I mean, if you don't know, probably the most popular form of yoga is Hatha yoga. Although that, the, that hot yoga seems to be um, giving it a run for its money, but I, let's just say, since I don't have any scientific data sets that I can quote, that uh, the most, certainly up there in the top two or three most popular forms of yoga right now is Hatha Yoga. And it's not even in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It's not even mentioned because it wasn't invented until about 700 years after the Yoga Sutras were written. And so it's not 
something you see discussed in depth psychology, esoteric interpretations of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, because it's not about spiritual union with God. It's about exercise, making your body look better, getting comfortable in your body, getting your body more flexible, stronger, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a difference between yoga as a spiritual discipline and, and yoga as a going to the gym kind of a thing. Now, there are yoga teachers who do try to bring in spirituality into their classes. And I, I guess that's why we have all kinds of yoga classes and people will go from class to class and kind of sort themselves out as they find the teacher that they resonate with. Some people don't want any spirituality. They want it to be like um, high school gym class. Other people want a little bit of spirituality in their yoga. Other people want like uh, intense emotional healing and spirituality in their yoga. But even the most spiritually oriented of yoga teachers have a difficult time giving as much depth and authenticity as they would like to because of the pressure from the world to keep it popular, keep it a commercial success, which means keep it shallow and superficial. Because if people who want to stay on the surface vastly outnumber the people who want to go deep. Staying on the surface, doing what everybody else does is comfortable, it's non-threatening, non-challenging, you know what's expected of you, you know what is expected of everyone else. Going deep is hard. But going deep may be the only thing that can save us. So I see the same thing happening now with breath work. A lot of people who, they never went deep in their training. I mean, when I was trained in breath work, it was hardcore. It was deep. You fasted. You did solitary retreats. You chanted for hours. You dove deep into your core negative beliefs night after night after night. Filling up notebook after notebook after notebook with journaling and affirmations and self-exploration. Now you can become a certified breath worker with a three-day course then go on Instagram and get 50,000 followers if you know how to market yourself and start teaching 50,000 people how to biohack themselves with breath work. And just like with yoga, there's a lot more interest, a lot more people interested in skating on the surface and there are people interested in going 
as deep into themselves as breathwork makes possible. But I also have cause for optimism because it seems as though more and more people every day are waking up, more and more people every day are experiencing this shift in consciousness away from the insane negative ego, the storyteller in the head, that voice in the head that is constantly telling you what things mean. Interpreting things from a standpoint of threat, trauma, and safety. Part of it is because consciousness wants to have this shift. Consciousness wants to make this shift. universal consciousness wants to do this so it's going to happen so each individual aspect of universal consciousness which is you your sister mary me we're being swept along swept up in the tide swept along and part of it is and this could just be another aspect of universal consciousness is that people are seeing with their own eyes that the truth is not what we've been led to believe. And so they're waking up. They're asking questions. They are becoming critical analyzers of the stories they are, are being spoon fed. Rather than, than just passive consumers of news products. And that helps to wake people up. That helps to bring about the shift in consciousness. And there are all kinds of Let's call it entry level breathwork techniques available on the internet, resonant breathing, coherent breathing, box breathing, all of these um, things that can give you a taste and people get a taste of those various things. And then they think, you know, well, if this little short thing can make me feel so much better, what, what if I went and got like a, a, a real two hour all out, all in, no holds barred, go for it, breathwork session with Ray. So I get a lot of things from a lot of people from that. And you get into an altered state of consciousness that lets you experience consciousness without that insane negative egoic conditioning running your software behind the scenes you don't even know it's there but then you get free of it and then you know then by comparison you compare how you were to how you are and you can see the difference and that is incredibly liberating for most people But what I'm arguing for here is the kind of hardcore breath work that I experienced as part of my initial introduction and then later training 
brought me to a state of consciousness where I value authenticity, community, real connection with real people, going to the depths, not being on the surface and being shallow and being superficial, being surrounded by plastic people. And I think everyone hungers for that. I think everyone who is living, which is the vast majority of people who are living on the surface, they know it's not good. You know it's not right. You know there's more to life than that. And you know that ultimately it's not healthy. It makes you sick. It gives you diseases. It gives you unhealthy relationships. In, in mass, it is destroying our planet. It is threatening us with war after war after war, forever wars. War is supposed to be an unusual thing, not a weekly occurrence. Did you know that? We stay on the surface because we're afraid to dive deep, because we're afraid of what we will find there. On some deep, unconscious level, you think you have messed up. You think you are wrong. You think you have done something horribly wrong, that you were fundamentally wrong, and you don't want to look at it. So you stay on the surface. But the only way we heal our planet, stop the wars, stop global, global warming, stop a fascist being, from being elected president of the United States in November, stop the genocide in Gaza, the only way we do any of that is not by more of the same old, same old, you're wrong, and then attacking each other. It's through the transcendence of love, rising up through the transcendence of love, love, L-O-V-E, rising above the battlefield by going deep within ourselves. I want something more. For the people. Than what is being offered to us. And for me, that path was breath work. But just being aware of the fact that you have a choice, I think is an important first step. And so that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. You have a choice. Now I want to lighten it up a little bit. Thanks for bearing with me. I want to lighten it up a little bit and 
talk about something that uh, is kind of off the wall. Kind of, yeah, off the wall. The red heifer. Have you heard about this? I mean, it's just like the red heifer, just like it sounds. It's a um, cow that's red. Um, it's not, it's sort of rare. Okay. Well, let's see, how should I tell this story? Well, let me start out by saying that this is a story about something going on in the Middle East right now. And it does not matter if you are, um, you know, you don't believe in the Bible, uh, you're a pagan, you're a seeker, you're an atheist. It's still going to affect you because the Jews and the Muslims do believe it. So, um, uh, just kind of like uh, <clears throat> update you on the history in case you don't know. Israel, the Jews in Israel, the Jews in the world have a belief that they need to rebuild the temple. The temple was destroyed by the Romans in like AD 70. And the Jews have been looking forward to being able to one day rebuild their temple. They feel called upon by God to have a temple, which means rebuilding their temple. And it needs to be, according to their religion, rebuilt on the original site. Problem is, is right now the Dome of the Rock is there. And that is a Muslim mosque, which is one of the holiest sites in all of Israel. So, of course, um, the, the Jews in Israel realize if they just go there with bulldozers, it's going to make, pro there, there will be problems. So they've basically just been waiting. They figure if God wants them to put their temple there, first there'll be a, he'll send an earthquake maybe, and, and the Dome of the Rock will be destroyed. Or maybe there'll be a war and an a artillery shell will go astray and the Dome of the Rock will be destroyed. They're, they've been looking, so they say, for an opportunity to rebuild their temple without angering the entire Muslim and Arab world. This would not be a minor thing if they just went there and if, if Israel just sent bulldozers to the Dome of the Rock and tore it down, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iran, Iraq would all be declaring war the next day. It, it would be a huge thing. So they have not done it. They've been, they, they've been again, they think they're supposed to rebuild their temple. They would like to do it without starting World War III. So they've been waiting for something to happen that would make it possible for them to rebuild the temple without getting into a war with every Arab, every Muslim in on the planet. All right, so... Israel or Judaism, you know, it's a very, um, how shall we say, ritual religion. There's a way of, a precise way of doing, doing everything. So they cannot rebuild the temple with just, They can't rebuild the temple with just any old any old tools. The tools that they use to build the temple, there's a very it's it's written out very precisely in Exodus 
which again, even if you don't believe in the Bible and you don't believe in Exodus, and you think it's just fairy tales, it doesn't matter. The Jews believe it and the Muslims believe it. So in order to rebuild the temple, they have to purify, ritually purify the tools that they use to build the temple. And the only way they can do that is by sacrificing a red heifer. And red heifers are, you know, they're not, they're somewhat rare, especially in the Middle East. Um, and they're not like rare, like a four leaf clover. Like if you see one in your life, you're lucky. They're more common than that. But it's not just any red heifer. It has to be a, a red heifer, which has never been pregnant or milked or yoked or no one's ever leaned on it. It's, you know, it's, it's a very special cat. And uh, they're somewhat rare in the Middle East, but actually it turns out in Texas, they're not all that rare, rare at all. So an Israeli delegation went to Texas and found five red heifers, which met all the requirements about never having been yoked or milked or leaned on, and they transported them to Israel. And they are in Israel right now, being protected and safeguarded to keep them ritually pure. And if they are sacrificed, that will be done to purify the tools that will be used to rebuild the temple. And you can't purify your tools and then wait 50 years to use them. If you purify them, you've got to use them pretty much right away. So if they sacrifice the red heifer, that means they're purifying the tools. That means they're rebuilding the temple. That means they're going to take down the Dome of the Rock and put the Jewish temple in its place. It cannot be built next door. It cannot be built on top of. It can only be built instead of, in the place of. So building the Jewish temple means destroying the Dome of the Rock. And building the Jewish, and, and having five red heifers ready to go in Israel means your ritual purification of your building tools is ready to go, which means you're thinking of taking down the Dome of the Rock. And as a matter of fact, the Hamas spokesperson who explained their reasons for what they did on October 7th one of the reasons that he gave was the presence of the red heifers. Just Israel going to Texas and getting five ritually acceptable red heifers and bringing them to Israel was enough to freak out Hamas that that was one of the reasons for October 7th. So they noticed the cows. And the, uh, according to news reports, the people that went to Texas and got the red heifer say they are going to do the sacrifice this month in April. Before the, they say it has to be done before the ending of Passover. Some reports I've seen say it's going to happen on April 8th, the day of the solar eclipse, which I haven't been able to verify that, and that seems weird. If you're going to ritually purify your tools for building your temple, doing it on a day of total darkness does not seem to me to be spiritually auspicious. 
all that I've been able to verify is that the people who got who went and brought the red heifers to Israel, they say it's going to happen this month. So if Hamas did what it did just because they went and got one, not only they had they had other reasons, but that this was one of their reasons. The fact that Israel went and got five red heifers from Texas that alarmed them. They didn't like that. So October seventh was they say partly caused by that. But if just going and getting them and putting them in a field had something to do with October seventh, can you imagine the response of the Muslim world if they actually go ahead with the sacrifice because they know what that means if they sacrifice the red heifer they intend to rebuild the temple which means they intend to take down the dome of the rock it because it can't be there's no other way to do it can't be otherwise And, you know, make no mistake about the importance of the Dome of the Rock to the Muslim world. If that, if that is even thought to be threatened, there will be Muslims from India or Pakistan that hardly ever give two thoughts to temples in the Middle East that will hop on a plane and fly to the Middle East to stand in front of the Dome of the Rock and keep it safe. And, you know, um, a, an interesting event happened to Baby Net, Bibi Netanyahu, current prime minister of Israel, early in his life, early in his political career. He was in the U.S. and he met with a Rebbe. And the fact that I say Rebbe instead of Rabbi right there, that tells you I'm talking about uh, a, a, an Hasidic, esoteric, Kabbalah practicing um, sect of Judaism with ardent followers. Nineveh is kind of a secular Jew. Most of Israel is run by secular Jews, by which I mean, you know, sort of like uh, most of America is run by secular Christians. Just like they go to, they go to church on Sunday, but the other six days of the week, they aren't particularly Christian. Um, Netanyahu and the secular Jews in Israel go to synagogue on Saturday, but the other six days of the week they aren't particularly Jewish. So this Rebbe, though, he's hardcore Jewish, and he told Netanyahu that he would that he Netanyahu would be the last prime minister of Israel before the Messiah came. Oh, by the way. They think the Jews think, you know, of course, of course, they don't think Jesus was the true Messiah. They are waiting for the true Messiah. And if they sacrifice the red heifer, ritually purify the tools, rebuild the temple with the, with the purified tools, the Messiah will come. So it's not about just getting their temple built. It's about fulfilling their eschatological function in the eyes of God. And so the Rebbe told Benjamin Netanyahu that he would be the last prime minister of Israel before the Messiah came. So Benjamin Netanyahu may have some eschatological leanings of his own.
He may feel that he has an important role to play in history, the history of the human race and the chosen people to bring about the return of God's kingdom on earth and the advent of the true Jewish Messiah. You know, it's like um, in the movie The Matrix, uh, who was it? Well, Cypher. Cypher says to Neo, so he told you you're the one, huh? Man, what a mind job, right? So uh, even though Netanyahu is fairly secular, this uh, Rebbe is, was held in high regard and considered one of Israel's spiritual leaders. And he told Netanyahu, You're, you will be the last prime minister before the Messiah returns or comes. So what a mind job. You know, what do you do with that? So there are all kinds of interesting psychological, political, social and cultural spiritual and religious aspects floating around in our world right now. So well, I was supposed to be lighter. It'll be interesting to see if it happens on April 8th, the day of the solar eclipse. Okay, well, uh, I started out a couple of weeks ago reading from Breath and Spirit. So um, I think we'll pick that up again with um, chapter two, the rebirthing technique. Breath is the key to the mystery of life, to that of the body as well as to that of the spirit. Lama Anagarika Govinda. Breathing is the interaction between our inner selves and the surrounding atmosphere. When we breathe, we absorb. I'm going to take a break and go get some water.
Let's see, April 8th. So that's that's this coming Monday. So next week's show, um we'll just we'll uh next week's show will be about whether or not we're all still here. There's a topic. So see you next week unless we cease to exist between now and then. Okay. <clears throat> Breathing is the interaction between our inner selves and the surrounding atmosphere. When we breathe, we absorb, in addition to physical substances, the surrounding reality into our inner system. It is essential, therefore, both for physical and psychological well-being that our breathing is optimal. On the purely physical level, for example, the manner in which we breathe is highly significant for the condition of our inner organs, dependent as they are on oxygen from the blood. But as we shall see, breathing also affects the mental and spiritual aspects of ourselves. Rebirthing or conscious breathing is the name of a particular breathing technique. Very briefly, it can be described as a relaxed, connected, and total way of breathing. This breathing pattern triggers a natural process of cleansing and purifying in both the body and the psyche. The combination of deep relaxation, openness of the mind and body, and increased oxygen intake tends to dissolve everything that stands in the way of the body's natural circulation. Uh, na the author, I would add natural energy circulation. The process has been found to be a very precise key to the body's natural healing resources. Once the process is initiated, the body seems to know exactly how to cleanse and revitalize itself. Although it is a purely physical exercise, the process does not just affect the body, but also has a direct effect on the psyche. The expansion of the body's circulation systems through relaxation and the increased speed of circulation facilitates the release of chemicals into the bloodstream. This has a cleansing effect on both the body and the psyche. The chemicals released into the system can, when they reach the brain, be perceived and interpreted as memories and previous experiences. Wilder Penfeld showed that it was possible to trigger photographic memories by touching various areas of the brain with an electrode during brain surgery. The rebirthing breathing technique has been found to be an equally powerful tool for releasing old memories. The fact that the process is initiated by physical activity, not mental, through increased openness, relaxation, and circulation makes it possible to release memories from the very earliest stages of life. Before the brain was fully developed, memories were recorded and stored in various parts of the body as bodily sensations. It is not possible to reach this type of memory through the mind. These early memories have not left a sufficient imprint in the original experience. 
These early memories have not left a sufficient imprint in the brain, only in the area of the body which was involved in the original experience. The cleansing effect on the body is often felt as an increase in energy. It can also generate a mental sharpening that brings the body to a higher level of functioning, both physically and psychologically. So that's one reason why uh, limit, limited core negatives, deep um, false beliefs that you have about yourself that holds you back, conditioning that keeps you from achieving as much as you otherwise could because it holds you back, these core negatives, a lot of them are pre-verbal. They were formed in you. You were infected with them before you even were talking, before you had language. So no amount of working with the mind, you know, therapy, talking therapy, um, verbal exercises can get at them because there's no verbal component to them. They, they were before you had verbal. They can be released in a breathwork session in a somatic way. There's a kinesthetic breathwork works verbally with affirmations and you know if you're if you're freeing yourself from some condition that took place in high school then yeah that's going to be verbal you're going to remember the incident and the fault you'll, you'll see right away the the erroneous interpretation you took of the incident and get free of it and then there's stuff that happened when you were in your mother's womb when you were six months old that's all pre-verbal and that gets released somatically. You, you feel it's a kinesthetic kind of a thing and you feel your way out of it. So that's what makes it so good. Um, of all the modern breathing techniques available today, and again, I'm reading from Breath and Spirit, Rebirthing as a Healing Technique by Danelle Manet. It's a real book. We've learned a lot since this book was written but from the standpoint of people who have no idea what rebirthing breath work is, it's a good introduction. So that's why I'm reading this. Of all the modern breathing techniques available today, rebirthing breathwork is the only one that focuses entirely on breath as the tool for cleansing, revitalizing, and purifying the body. Speaking of authenticity, Another reason that I'm reading this book, which is subtitled Rebirthing as a Healing Technique, is because most people think of rebirthing breath work as a, a kind of advanced form of meditation that's good for personal growth and spiritual growth, spiritual advancement, personal growth. And that's how I thought of it. But the fact of the matter is that... Um, I was diagnosed with a disease that was supposed to leave me crippled in a wheelchair, my body racked in pain. And breath work killed me from that disease. And when I first came here to St. Croix, after working at the World Global Center for Rebirthing in New York and basically putting in 20 hour days for several years and being exhausted. I came here, nobody had any idea who I was or what my what I did, which was kind of fine with me because um, I wanted to rest. 
And to pay bills, I took a part-time job. And one of my coworkers, and, and I wanted to keep my breathwork spiritual life completely separate from my nine to five life. So I never mentioned anything about breathwork. One of my coworkers um, was sick. She never mentioned that she was sick. But then again, why would she? I never mentioned that I did breath work and that it had healed me from a disease that was supposed to leave me crippled in a wheelchair in god awful pain for the rest of my life. Well, come long story short, that coworker wound up dying of the very same disease. That coworker died of the same disease that I was cured from with not even 10 sessions of breath work. And I never knew she was sick. She never knew I could help her because I didn't say anything. This happened, uh, what, like 20 years ago now. And I have always felt bad about that. I have always felt bad about that. So I want people to understand that this modality um, is available to you for healing. And it's not just about you know, the latest Tony Robbins Stop Procrastinating Today workshop. It's um, a really serious, powerful healing modality for healing all kinds of things. Um, I have, I have, you can. I have information on the, on the website or whatever if you want to look it up, but I don't want anybody dying because they didn't know, because I didn't say anything. Again, that's not happening again. So that's another reason why I'm reading this book over the radio airwaves, the electromagnetic field of WSTX. AM 970, the soul of the Caribbean. Of all the modern breathing techniques available today, rebirthing is the only one that focuses entirely on breath as the tool for cleansing, revitalizing, and purifying the body. In many schools of modern psychotherapy, breath is used as a tool to get in touch with subconscious thoughts and feelings. They are de then dealt with through some form of mental and emotional catharsis. In rebirthing, however, the focus is entirely on the breath. We don't do catharsis. Maintaining a relaxed, open pattern of breathing is the key to our inner selves. The underlying assumption is that every thought and emotion is also a form of energy and can be expressed as such through the breath. This makes the technique especially relevant because an absolutely essential aspect of healing the body and mind involves changing the way we breathe. Life energy. Rebirthing breath work can also be described like ancient breathing techniques as a method of activating the life energy by opening up the body's full breathing capacity. Life energy is a concept which has a central significance in Eastern cultures, but is more or less unknown in the West. The Eastern concept is described at greater length in later chapters. Here, life energy can simply be understood as the driving force for the body and psyche. Activating it leads to a sense of harmonious openness and an ability to experience and use the body and the psyche in a completely unrestricted way. We, 
we in the Western world have a long tradition of physical and mental health care, but we totally lack any tradition of working with pure life energy. It is a part of the picture that has been total, totally lost for us. Working with the direct life energy is like giving people a new tool. In today's world, many people are so depressed that they completely lack the energy to even begin to deal with their problems. They need more life energy in order to be able to deal with their situation and to receive inspiration to struggle for a change. They also need more life in the body in order to be able to feel and experience themselves. It can be said that breathing is our most unused natural resource. Breathing provides the greatest potential for positive change. The method of breathing in rebirthing breathwork is designed to open up the body's natural energy streams to stimulate the circulation so that the energy of the body can flow unhindered. This enhancement of the body's energy circulation provides optimal conditions for the body and the psyche to unfold their inherent abilities. Among these are powerful natural drives for physical and psychological healing. Rebirthing breath work can stimulate a quicker renewal of cells, facilitating the body's renewal and vitalization. The stimulation, however, is achieved through relaxation. The relaxation enables blocked memories to be released these memory blocks are associated with experiences which, for whatever reason, have not been worked through and integrated physically and mentally. They've been simply pushed down into the unconscious. These blockages can hinder or actively work against our conscious intentions. I sometimes I joke with people. You, emo, you, you're emotionally constipated, and and I'm the ex lax. By resolving and releasing them, a higher level of consciousness can be attained. Psychic energy can be more effectively focused on present, consciously chosen tasks, leading to an improved level of performance. And, you know, so right here we see the beginnings of that superficiality thing. Make yourself a better performer. Make yourself a better worker. It's about having a better quality of life. The economic benefits Well, if your present consciously chosen task is to be emotionally healthy, okay, then then an improved level of performance, uh, I'll, I'll go with that. Who knows what she's really talking about here. I suppose, however you slice it, in any endeavor or whatever, endeavor, whatever life you're talking about, being able to be peacefully in the present moment, doing whatever you're doing, being yourself is better than being a half crazy person with the you're not good enough story running in your head. And all the problems you have with your mother from three years old, right? That doesn't feel good. 
Rebirthing takes as its basic model a pattern to be found in the natural breathing of small children and peace, people peacefully asleep. In other words, the breathing of a harmonic and totally relaxed person. In actual sessions, the intensity of the breathing can be much higher than in everyday life. In the modern world, it is difficult to find adults who still have this basic natural breathing pattern, with the exception of certain isolated groups of primitive people. Not primitive, more in touch with nature on a daily basis is how what I would say. the natural rhythms of life in nature's cycles. Is conducive to the state of consciousness I've been talking about. The unnatural artificial rhythms of life in man made cycles. is an artifact and artifice of this irrational negative ego that on the individual level makes you miserable and on the collective level threatens us with extinction. Nearly all adults have, to a greater or lesser extent, constant muscular tension and energy blocks. Of all the body's functions, it is in breathing that these aberrations manifest most. Their effects on breathing prevent the body functioning at its full capacity. Although rebreathing breathwork has clear links with ancient Eastern breathing techniques, it cannot simply be said to be a rediscovery of the old methods. Rebreathing breathwork was developed in America in the early 1970s, mainly by Leonard Orr. He and he evolved the technique purely by experimenting with various breathing patterns and studying their effects on the body and psyche. Despite this independent origin, the technique that has emerged has many similarities with the ancient techniques. The development of breathwork can be described in the following way, or first Leonard Orr first noticed that changing the breathing produced dramatic and or bizarre experiences. When explanations for these experiences were sought, the medical and psychological literature did not provide much guidance. There were no descriptions of variations in the breathing patterns or observations of how breathing influenced the body and psyche. The only explanations that fully recognized the importance of various breathing patterns were found in the Eastern schools of yoga and Qigong. Eastern knowledge has therefore come to form a theoretical foundation for the method. Initially, Orr was not doing systematic psychological research. He describes his early work as simply a step in a more general search for methods of self-improvement. To begin with, this search consisted mainly of or subjecting his own body to various, to different types of external influence. He spent extremely long periods in the heat of a sauna and kept his body submersed in warm or cold water for several hours in order to see what effects this would have. 
he soon discovered that certain situations led to strong emotional reactions. He recalled memories of traumatic situations, often related to birth. He also noted that these experiences led to a spontaneous change in the breathing pattern. He then began to experiment with various ways of breathing in an attempt to reproduce the rhythms he had observed. This led to even stronger reactions and more vivid memory experiences of his own birth and other traumatic events. Later on, he began to teach others how to obtain these experiences. He would sit with them and guide their breathing in order to reproduce the patterns he had discovered. He found that most people reacted as he had done. With the birth trauma, as a common element in their experiences. This reoccurrence, this recurrence of experiences relating to birth led to the method becoming known as rebirthing, but it is also known by several other names, the most common of these being conscious breathing, conscious connected breathing, and spiritual breathing. In the beginning, Orr conducted all breathing exercises in warm water thinking that the water was essential to the experience. Or had his first Spontaneous rebirthing experiences submerged in very hot water. Participants lay submerged in water, either floating on their backs or face down, breathing through a snorkel. As an alternative to hot water, sleeping bags were used. People would lay in them for periods of up to 14 hours in order to simulate the prenatal environment. Sessions in these spaces conditions often led to intensely strong emotional reactions. The participant had to be removed from the special environment in order to finish off the session in a calmer setting. This development led successively to an abandonment of the contrived environments. Dry sessions without water, which led to the same reactions but in a calmer circumstance, became the standard practice. Leonard Orr discovered that as an individual progressed through a series of breathing sessions, the strong emotional reactions would disappear if the person could interpret the implications of the traumatic experience they were reliving. This process later became known as integration. Integration generally led not only to the disappearance of the traumatic reaction but also to a dissolution of the complex of behavior patterns associated with it. Sometimes a memory might recur on several occasions and lead to many insights before it was finally dissolved. Only when the whole event had been re-experienced and interpreted would it disappear totally from the breathing session. Well, so I want to, Ray here, I want to comment a little bit about some of this. Well, I just want to, um, um, you know, don't make the mistake of thinking that, that this only is for some sort of severe trauma condition. Um, like you were horribly abused as a child or a veteran with PTSD. It, it is good for that. But it also helps people have better relationships with their parents. I have like 40-year-olds that can deal with their mom. And it stems from trauma. It's real trauma, the human condition. 
is trauma, really. Um, but there's a tendency to, to take ordinary life as nothing special. So how, how traumatic could it be? You know, I don't have the problems of so-and-so. That was actual trauma. But it's only a difference of, of degree, not quality, quantity, not quality. It's you, the person with a real, like, obvious trauma condition. Maybe their suffering is more visible and more obvious. But a person who doesn't have that kind of uh, stereotypical, classically considered trauma, but has just the ordinary trauma of being an ordinary human being, they suffer also. And it might be something as as commonplace as not being able to be around their own mother for more than five minutes without getting into a shouting match. But that's not, that doesn't have to be normal. That happens because of what they call today trauma, you know, what used to be known as just negative core beliefs, core conditioning. You're set up to fail. There's triggers around your relationships with your mother that set you up for problems and they are unconscious and they don't have to uh, ruin your relationship with your mother, your life or hold you back in any way. It is strongly recommended that one's first rebirthing breathwork session should be conducted under the supervision of an experienced therapist. The first reactions to the technique can be intense, unfamiliar, and sometimes rather frightening for someone who is new to this kind of exercise. The experience can therefore be overwhelming unless guidance is available from someone familiar with the process. Leonard Orr told me once that basically um, just you sitting next to someone while they're doing it re, uh, re, 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 reassures them on a subconscious level because they're the person who's doing the breathing as they start to experience unfamiliar sensations, their subconscious mind is going, well, the guy is sitting next to me. He's done this hundreds of times and he seems okay. So it's probably safe. The experience can therefore be overwhelming unless guidance is available from someone familiar with the process. An experienced rebirthing breathwork therapist can give support and assist the novice breather to maintain the correct breathing pattern, which is the best safeguard against negative reactions. When enough blocked material has been released, I would say integrated, However, most people feel safe enough to do it alone or together with a friend who can give sufficient support. 
Since the technique can be done alone, it is a very useful tool during stressful periods. It can also be used to enhance performance on special occasions as a relaxation method or to provide extra energy. Rebirthing and ordinary breathing, the differences. Well, you know what? There's kind of really no point in going into that. And it is now one, but uh, yeah, it's about time to bring the show to a close. I want to thank you all for tuning in. And, uh, see you next Friday. Hopefully. Solar eclipses, red heifer startup, red heifer sacrifices, and CERN startups. Notwithstanding, if we're still here next Friday, I will be here. Remember to get out in nature, get out to the beach, stand next to a tree, try to feel the energy of the tree. Yeah, I know. You're all set to do sessions with me till I say something like that. Then you're like, he's crazy. It's energy. The shift in consciousness lets you see that it is all one. It is all one energy. It is light. And there are <clears throat> just different ways of, of getting in touch with that energy. People could be sensitive to one thing that are not sensitive to something else. There's something about nature that seems to work for almost all human beings. You know, which is why the 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 primitive people she's talking about still breathe like babies. They breathe like human beings. Their breathing has not become dysfunctional, has not been made dysfunctional through getting out of touch with the natural cycles. Uh, so we'll turn it over now. Um, thank you for listening. Catch you next Friday at 1230 Atlantic Standard Time here on WSTX AM 970, the soul of the Caribbean. Also get us on WSTX's Facebook page, Ray Branch's Facebook page, um, my YouTube, also the podcast, Sacred Breath. I have a website, sacredbreathfreedom.com. And Instagram. Um, love you all. Take care. See you next Friday.
Bye.